Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from the Rosalind P. Walter Foundation, the Bluestein Family Foundation, the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, Carnegie Corporation of New York, the Russell Sage Foundation, the Malkin Fund, May and Samuel Rudin Family Foundation, and from the corporate community, Mutual of America. I'm Richard Hefner, your host on The Open Mind, and my guest today is Dr. Jonathan Fanton, American historian and university president who for the past decade has led the huge, the prestigious, the excitingly innovative John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation. Now, a number of foundation chieftains have joined me here at this table over the past half century and more in conversation about their challenges and opportunities, about their programs and plans, about the very American quality of foundations themselves. Dean Rusk, George Harrar, John Knowles, and Peter Goldmark, all presidents of the Rockefeller Foundation, have been here on The Open Mind at one time or another. So have Carnegie Corporation presidents John Gardner, David Hamburg, and of course, Vartan Gregorian and Russell Sage Foundation President Eric Wanner, Ford Foundation President Franklin Thomas, Revson Foundation President Eli Evans, and the Open Society Institute's Ari Nair and George Soros have discussed the foundation world here as well, all striving to make a difference with their resources as they inevitably do. Yet even as my guest prepares this year to conclude his own decade presiding over the MacArthur Foundation, the resources of all who give and get have been diminished. And today I would first like Jonathan Fanton to expand upon his letter to the editor in the New York Times some weeks back when he stated that foundations should maintain, even increase their giving in difficult economic times. The issues the MacArthur Foundation confronts at home and abroad, human rights, conservation, and affordable housing preservation, among others, grow more, not less urgent when the global economy is in recession. The thrust to what my guest wrote then, of course, was quite direct. The MacArthur Foundation's endowment has declined this year, yet we remain committed to being a long-term steady partner to organizations we support. We chose to maintain our grant-making levels in past recessions, and we intend to do so again now. But I would ask Dr. Fatten whether most other foundations are likely to do the same. Indeed, Dr. Fatten, can they? Well, uh, my guess is most foundations, big ones, will uh, stay the course at least through 09, I think a, a real test will come uh, in 2010 uh, and beyond. Uh, MacArthur, uh, and you well stated uh, our position, uh, believes that we have an obligation to the issues we work on and to the people and organizations we support to be there for them uh, at a time of, of need. Um, we made a lot of growth in our endowment over the past few years, and now we're giving some of it back, but that seems only right. We've also set aside a uh, uh, modest uh, special fund on top of our normal giving to help uh, grantees with particular uh, difficulties uh, in the year ahead. What do you anticipate is going to happen to not just your grantees, but grantees around the country and around the world? Because, of course, you reach out beyond national borders? Well, uh, MacArthur wants to be a steady force and wants to calm things down. 
calm uh, things down. It seems to me you stir things up. Well, we stir things up in the work we do, but at this moment when people are anxious, they need to look at some institutions they can trust and count on. And uh, I'm very careful about not uh, aggregating uh, anecdotal information and leaving the impression that uh, organizations we support are in free fall or stepping back from the front lines of human rights in Nigeria, conservation in Peru, uh, women's health uh, in Mexico, and all the other good things we do. Uh, I think it's time to uh, just to keep our senses about us, realize this will go on for a bit, but we'll come through it, uh, and to be happy that our grantees are resilient, flexible, uh, adaptive organizations uh, which can grow, but also continue to do good work with fewer resources. And our job is to cushion the impact of the uh, recession both here and abroad. You know, years ago I asked Peter Goldmark very pointedly about, uh, well, I don't even know quite how to put it. I didn't then, and I don't know that I succeeded very well, but I was thinking about the role that major foundations play in taking positions, supporting positions, that the elected representatives of the American people do not take. Maybe you're not going to have to worry about now that now in the Obama years. But what about that strange combination of foundations moving in one direction and government moving in another? Well, MacArthur, um, while based in the U.S., is a global institution. So we're looking at uh, governments all over the world, not just in the U.S. Uh, we take the long view. Uh, we're not uh, working on an issue just for tomorrow, but for 10 years uh, from today. Uh, as we think about our role in public policy, which is what you're asking, I'd say there are four or five uh, elements to it. The first is to uh, get the question right, uh, to f approach a question in a fresh and, and different way. For example, we supported Brookings and Harvard and Stanford um, on the Cooperative Threat Reduction Program, which resulted in the Nunn Lugar uh, legislation that was a cooperative venture between the U.S. and uh, the Soviet Union in uh, reducing uh, uh, dangers of weapons of mass destruction, uh, reducing stockpiles. Uh, we do research that comes up with solid objective evidence that uh, can be used to influence policy. Uh, we have research networks on complicated issues like uh, adolescent development and juvenile justice. This network some years ago uh, did path-breaking work, uh, I think proving beyond a shadow of a doubt that kids are different developmentally. Their uh, ability to reason and competence to make judgment uh, matures uh, not at uh, 15, but uh, in the later teens. Uh, and it was this path-breaking work that was cited in uh, the Supreme Court case of uh, Roper v. Simmons uh, that outlawed the death penalty for children uh, under 18, uh, as an example. Um, modeled uh, demonstration projects would be a third way in which we can influence uh, policy. For example, um, take us now out to the um, South Pacific, where MacArthur works on uh, conservation, as we do in uh, 30 countries around the world. Very important to uh, encourage local people to be partners uh, in conservation, and in this case, uh, not overfishing uh, around the shores of Fiji. And we um, put in place a model project that had local councils uh, uh, police uh, the uh, amount of fishing that was done. These are called locally ma managed uh, marine areas, and from this uh, little beginning in Fiji, they're now um, seven uh, countries and 250 sites all across the South Pacific where these locally managed uh, uh, marine areas are now in, in force. Um, another area, uh, another way we, we help is to set norms, uh, that is to say to do the intellectual work that leads to the evolution of norms. And here an example would be the Commission on uh, Humanitarian uh, Intervention and State Sovereignty, which the uh, country of Canada uh, put together. We put some money into it, and uh, this came up with the uh, uh, notion of the responsibility to protect, basically uh, saying that when a country fails to 
protect its own citizens, or worse, is the aggressor. The responsibility to protect citizens rises up to the international community. And the UN adopted that in, at the summit in 2005 as uh, a, a norm the world would try to uh, abide by. And finally, um, we can affect policy um, by shows like this one, by supporting uh, uh, quality uh, journalism, uh, public television, uh, getting good uh, information uh, that people can use in the belief uh, that people, when they know uh, the facts, uh, they will choose their leaders and policies wisely. So in all those ways, I think uh, we can be helpful, and none of them really uh, is pinpointed to uh, affecting a particular policy at a particular moment. Some of our grantees do that, but we take the long run. Now, you can take the long run, I gather, because uh, your founder basically yes. said, I made the money, you make the decisions how to spend it. Yeah. Is that rare in American philanthropy? I, I think it is rare, um, and you have it right. John MacArthur said, uh, I made the money, uh, you fellows figure out how to spend it. So the board has had the freedom over the years to decide what the most urgent uh, problems are in places uh, where we could add value. You have the easiest answer then at hand to those who have been saying that foundations sort of spit in the eye of their founders. Let's take Carnegie, let's take Rockefeller, let's take the other industrial giants or robber barons, call them what you will, who have founded the major uh, foundations of today. Well, most of the um, wealth that has endowed these foundations comes from people who were really smart and uh, themselves very uh, attuned and alert to opportunities. So I think it's in the spirit of a Rockefeller or a Carnegie uh, to imagine that um, they would have a point of departure, but they would imagine uh, that the world would change, and if they were still living, they would be changing with that world. That's a fascinating <laughs> way to uh, put it. Awful lot of conservative people in this country would take exception to that. Maybe, but uh, I think it's a mistake to uh, line up foundations on a left to right uh, political spectrum. Um, that We don't see ourselves as left or right. Uh, we don't see ourselves as uh, um, on a political spectrum. There are characteristics that we own up to. Uh, we're optimists. We believe that humankind uh, can improve. Uh, we believe in fairness and transparency. Uh, we believe um, in stewardship, that uh, every generation has an obligation uh, to the future. Um, we believe in opportunity and uh, trying to help those less fortunate uh, develop their talents. These don't strike me as left or right uh, values, but as basic American values. Uh, and uh, I would like to think that uh, the work we do uh, and the words that would come to mind when you hear the word MacArthur is objective, uh, high-quality research, uh, non-ideological uh, in the public interest. You say non-ideological, right. and yet you also say you find this to be in the best tradition right. of the American past. Now, I wanted to ask you about your own background as an American historian and how much uh, it has played in your comfort level with what the MacArthur Foundation started to do 30 years ago and that you have continued over the past decade? Well, as an historian, uh, and you also have studied history, uh, I believe in looking uh, at the current moment uh, in the arc of history and asking, uh, where are we? I do think uh, history comes in cycles. Um, I read a book and used to teach it at Yale called Seed Time for Reform. It was a book about the 1920s and it was a revisionist uh, theory. Uh, the 20s were seen as a, a kind of arid period, not much going on, um, but uh, this book argued that there was uh, an enormous amount of experimentation happening at the state and local level uh, and that experimentation uh, was seed corn for the New Deal. Uh, when Franklin Roosevelt came to office. I think we've been in a period, um, in a way equivalent to that, uh, in which uh, a lot of good ideas have been 
uh, brewing uh, have been uh, experimented with at the state and local level that now will be drawn on as America enters uh, what I believe will be a new period of, um, of reform. Well, when New York's Mayor Giuliani sneeringly spoke about community organizer uh, at the Republican convention, um, I didn't wonder then, but I wonder now, uh, what the relationship of the MacArthur Foundation will be to the new administration. After all, you're located in Chicago, you have a peculiar, particular interest in community organization in Chicago. And how will the state from which our new president comes and what he has done with his life affect what you'll be doing? Well, you mentioned our work in Chicago. It's uh, community organizing it wouldn't be the way I would describe it. Um, we uh, work intensively with um, most of the high poverty neighborhoods in Chicago, having made a 10-year commitment uh, to work on all the issues that must work together in the same time. Um, education, jobs, economic development, uh, housing preservation, uh, public safety. Uh, health uh, and all the rest. Uh, but this is not a theory that begins by saying um, community groups can do it alone. It's a theory that says community groups, uh, government, the not-for-profit sector, uh, the market forces all have to work together uh, to uh, bring these uh, promising uh, neighborhoods um, uh, to a place where they uh, can develop and open opportunity uh, for their residents. And uh, I would hope that uh, the president-elect uh, um, has looked at our work, which we do in partnership with uh, the local initiative support corporation, not just in Chicago, but it's been taken as the Chicago model to a dozen uh, other cities around the country. I would hope uh, that uh, he would be aware of that. Um, I'm very happy to see that a number of uh, grantees that MacArthur supported are assuming an important positions in the new administration. The Secretary of Education is our uh, CEO of uh, Chicago Public Schools and we've supported uh, his work. Arnie Duncan, a fabulously talented uh, uh, leader. Uh, Sean Donovan, uh, the new Housing Commissioner, has received MacArthur's support both as an individual and then as his work as Commissioner here uh, in New York uh, for 15 uh, years, Cecilia Munoz of the Council of La Raza um, is working on intergovernment affairs, longtime grantee John Holdren, uh, the new science advisor, was a trustee of MacArthur, uh, um, and so it goes. We have a number of uh, people in high places that have been supported by MacArthur, have worked with MacArthur, and in the housing field, for example, we brought a whole number of our grantees together uh, three years ago to begin working on uh, a set of um, uh, policies that we would hope a new administration, whoever it would be, uh, uh, might embrace. So I think there is on the ready uh, very specific, concrete, useful uh, ideas that have been developed in this uh, last 10-year uh, period. Of course, you remind me of what was said uh, in the FDR days when yeah. Columbia University played such a large role in supplying Right. people to the New Deal, and we called it the germ of Columbia, the germ of the notion, right. <laughs> and it seemed to be just that. Uh, yeah. Intellectually uh, speaking, um, do you think that the new administration will latch on to much that you have done, even beyond the personnel that you have mentioned thus far? Uh, I'm hopeful that uh, the new administration uh, will take a different approach to uh, the rest of the world. Uh, I'm hopeful that a spirit of partnership uh, will uh, reemerge. Uh, I'm hopeful that the um, work we've supported, uh, through, articulated in an op-ed piece by uh, George Schultz and Bill Perry and Henry Kissinger, and Sam Nunn uh, calling for a rekindling of the spirit of Reykjavik to get going on the nuclear disarmament uh, issue. I'm hopeful that will be uh, taken up by the new administration. Uh, I'd expect uh, 
uh, attention to uh, climate change is a real issue, and that's important to us because we're preserving areas of high biodiversity around the world that are threatened by uh, climate change. So, yes, I'm optimistic. I caution, as always, uh, as you and I as historians know, that expectations can run very high. Uh, President-elect has to concentrate on the economic crisis uh, to start with. Uh, and I would not favor pressing him on every issue um, on the 21st of January. I think uh, I have confidence that uh, he's putting a good team together. They will sort out their priorities and that we will see over uh, the next few years uh, a number of these issues uh, uh, addressed, but I wouldn't expect uh, all the questions we care about uh, to be addressed in, uh, in year one. Fair enough, but in the year one, which issues? would you press? Well, I think the economy is the uh, overwhelming um, concern. Uh, and I would remind him, if he were to ask, um, uh, of the mistake that Franklin Roosevelt made. Uh, remember, Franklin Roosevelt came to uh, office, uh, I'd say as a fiscal conservative, believing in balanced budgets, was very loath to uh, uh, do too much uh, deficit spending. And the New Deal really didn't put enough um, into the stimulus package of that day uh, until it was clear by, I think, 36 uh, that it simply wasn't working. And then uh, much more was put in, and of course the war came along. And uh, so I would urge the president-elect not, uh, uh, not to be too cautious to uh, uh, undertake the stimulus measures that are going to be required to get the economy moving uh, and be mindful, as I know he will be, that there's a long-term fiscal challenge that uh, has our deficit mounts that we have to deal with, but we'll let, uh, that comes second. But you know, I recently, I'm revising my documentary history of the United States and will include the new president's uh, inaugural address, of course, and many of the other speeches. But I went back and read, reread FDR's second inaugural address, which we think of in terms of a rendezvous with destiny. But I was astonished by the radical, the economic radicalism of that address. And when I think of what is being said now, what was said in the past election, and what the Obama to be administration seems to be uh, looking like, I'm astonished by the uh, by the fact that FDR was so much more radical, at least in words, in 1936-37 than he was in 32. Yeah, yeah, and he learned. Well, and uh, then uh, and he learned. Yeah. Well, he learned, but then uh, much more radical than I think the president elect. Uh, seems to be, or his primary challenger, Senator Clinton, seemed to be. Well, we'll have to see how that uh, plays out. You ask about um, foundations and how we um, intersect with public policy, and I mentioned that we think long term. There's not much we can do um, day to day, the first 100 days, that's not our, our role. But we have three related projects underway that uh, will have some significance over time and I'll tell you just real quickly, if I may. The first is a network, um, a research network, uh, looking at the aging society, uh, re-projecting the estimates of uh, how long we're going to live, how much disability-free uh, uh, life we're going to enjoy going forward, and what implications uh, longer life uh, will mean for, on the positive side, uh, what you and I can do as we get older, uh, and on the challenging side, uh, what the cost will be to uh, Medicare, Social Security, and all the rest. Uh, that, in turn, will inform a second project. We've supported a, an expert committee at the uh, National Academies to lay out the fiscal challenge this country faces even before uh, the recent economic downturn, and it's stark. Uh, we're building up deficits at a very rapid rate. The baby boom generation living longer are going to press entitlement costs uh, uh, through the roof. Uh, and we will face, um, within the next uh, 20 uh, or 30 years, a, a, a truly unmanageable 
fiscal situation unless corrective action uh, is taken uh, within the next 10 years and so on the watch of uh, the next president. And the purpose of this uh, expert commission and the National Academy's very careful uh, vetting process is to lay it all out in a way the public uh, and policymakers can understand uh, and trust. And the third and final uh, initiative we have going is a series of what I would call complex cost-benefit analyses that show that government programs that are well designed and well implemented actually uh, save money. And we're so used to thinking of uh, the interests of people in trouble and need as um, different from the interests of the rest of us. But I think that's a paradigm that will need to shift and I hope will shift in the course of the new administration. I'll give you an example. Uh, uh, Ned Gramlich um, did a study uh, many years ago of uh, kids in a federal preschool program in Ypsilanti, Michigan called the Perry Preschool. And he followed those kids for 30, 40 years uh, versus kids who were not in a federal preschool program. It was amazing to see how much better uh, kids who had, had a modest investment in preschool uh, training did with respect to uh, graduating from high school and college, uh, getting better jobs, paying higher taxes, uh, avoiding welfare, committing fewer crimes. And when all was said and done, the public got a $17 uh, return, inflation adjusted for every dollar invested. And that pattern, which then turns on its head this notion that when you help uh, poor people, uh, it's just a tax burden on you, uh, just isn't true. It's a, it's a wise investment. And we're showing, we're doing studies in health and housing, uh, community development, uh, uh, prisoner reentry, and I believe that same pattern is going to uh, reveal itself. So, people living longer, uh, bigger entitlements, bigger uh, social deficits, uh, fiscal deficits coming up, but some hope that we can learn how to use our public dollars more wisely. Dr. Fanton, my mother used to say from your lips when she liked something to God's ear, so one might say from your lips to Barack Obama's ear. And that's all the time we have for this program. You've promised to sit there and wait and do a second program. Thank you for joining me today. I've had a great time. Thank you for very good questions. And thanks, too, to you in the audience. I hope you join us again next time as well. And for transcripts of today's program, please send $4 in check or money order to The Open Mind, P.O. Box 7977, FDR Station, New York, New York, 10150. Meanwhile, as an old friend used to say, good night and good luck. I'm Richard Hefner, your host on The Open Mind, and this is our second program with Dr. Jonathan Fanton. American historian and university president who for the past decade has led the huge, the prestigious, the excitingly innovative John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation. Later this year, he turns over MacArthur's presidency to his successor. Well, we began last time talking about Dr. Fanton's public insistence that in tough times, foundations must keep giving went on to talk about giving for what, discussing MacArthur's eclectic patterns of philanthropy. And now more of the same with my beginning, Dr. Fanton, to pick up something you said last time, use the word fairness, and in reading through much that you have written, I see that that concept plays a very important role, not just in your decade at MacArthur, but in your life. Expand upon that. Well, um, my family first came to this country in the uh, 1680s. We've stayed in Connecticut as our home base um, ever since. Stick uh, in the mud, sir. Well, not very venturesome, uh, people say. Uh, and I guess I have a sense of uh, why they came and what the revolution was fought for and what the basic values uh, are uh, in this country. Uh, fairness, uh, tolerance, openness, uh, democratic uh, way of governance, uh, a belief um, in the uh, power of the individual, uh, a commitment to um, creativity and uh, opportunity. Uh, those are basic 
American values that aren't left or right, but they've united us uh, over all these years and uh, put us in good stead and explained why America has been a leader. Uh, remember, we were founded as a city upon a hill, uh, meant to be an example uh, for the rest of the world of how uh, people could g live together uh, in a spirit of tolerance uh, and uh, govern themselves democratically. Do you think those values play the same role now that they did in your years of maturing? Um, you mentioned earlier I was an optimist. I confess uh, I am. I hope not naive. But I uh, do believe that uh, our country continues to uh, set a standard. Uh, and I'm hoping in the future that we will uh, do even better in uh, being that city upon the hill uh, for the rest of the world. Part of what MacArthur does as a global institution working in 60 countries around the world uh, is to bring the face of America uh, to the rest of the world. And even at a time when the rest of the world has had doubts uh, about uh, our government, I think they have welcomed uh, MacArthur uh, working on conservation, uh, working on uh, reducing maternal mortality uh, in Africa, uh, protecting human rights, uh, in Russia uh, and uh, Nigeria, Mexico, China, other places we work. Well, you know, talking before we went on the air, uh, talking about your years at the New School University, and I said that I had taught there back in the glory days um, when it was still almost a university in exile, and that my friend Max Lerner had first gotten me to uh, down there, and I remember Max saying at this table, not physically this table, but here on the open mind, asking about how he would define his, his philosophy, and he said, I'm a possibilist. And as I read through many of your speeches, many of your addresses, I thought there must be something contagious about that. You seem to be primarily a possibilist. And I wondered whether that's uh, seeped into your direction of the uh, foundation. And I was thinking of the, your project in juvenile justice and how large a role your sense of fairness, your sense of possibilities played uh, in, in what you've done in that area. Well, um, I, I, one very interesting characteristic of the MacArthur Foundation, 30 years old this year, uh, is consistency. Uh, it's known for creativity, for taking risks, for doing new things, all that's true. But it also uh, chooses issues and stays with them for a long time. Presidents come and go, trustees come and go, but there are a series of uh, fields that we are in, including uh, juvenile justice, that um, we uh, stay with. So. Uh, the important work in juvenile justice, uh, the research work, uh, began before my time, and that was a um, network on uh, adolescent development and juvenile justice that uh, asked a, a simple question. Uh, do uh, young people uh, have the same uh, ability at 14 and 15 to weigh the consequences of their acts as adults? And uh, if not, uh, shouldn't they uh, uh, have the opportunity uh, to have a system of justice that is uh, appropriate for them, as opposed to be uh, putting uh, uh, into a, a, uh, an adult uh, justice system? Um, the uh, study, um, I think, definitively uh, demonstrated that young people do uh, mature. Uh, uh, at a rate that means that they're they're in their late teens before they're uh, able to uh, weigh the consequences of their acts the same way uh, you and I might, uh, and that has led us therefore to uh, start a program uh, called Models for Change that seeks to uh, encourage states uh, to put in place uh, juvenile justice systems, and those systems uh, are characterized by. Um, taking account of uh, developmental differences, uh, searching for alternatives to incarceration uh, that uh, teach kids skills that they can use to reintegrate back into society, that have aftercare programs so it isn't just a, um, a judgment and then uh, goodbye, but there's uh, continued uh, caring for the youngster, uh, 
takes account of uh, the fact that a high proportion of kids who get in trouble have uh, mental uh, or emotional uh, illnesses and therefore uh, a good juvenile justice system uh, spots and treats those uh, illnesses. And um, long story short, uh, our network uh, followed uh, a group of kids who went through uh, states with juvenile justice systems and then another group that were, went through adult uh, uh, systems. And the kids who went through the juvenile justice system with alternatives to incarceration, all the things I just talked about, were less likely to reoffend in a three-year period by 60%. Uh, just think about that. 60% less likely to reoffend. And think about what that means. Uh, you're safer than you would be, and you're paying less taxes uh, because these kids are uh, being constructive citizens and not reoffending, not getting back into jail. Yeah, but you know, I went back recently and looked at the transcript of an open mind program from over a half century ago mm -hmm. uh, with Gavarasius, Mary Cola, um, Judge Kelly, saying the same things with the same determination and the same emotional content. Mm -hmm. What does that say about us as a people if we knew those things, if research had demonstrated those things a half century ago? Well, what's different now um, is there is a receptivity uh, to, the, uh, to the evidence. And the evidence is, is uh, with due respect, uh, scientifically more solid now than before. And what we in, are trying to do at MacArthur is start a national movement. Uh, we began with four states, um, Pennsylvania, Louisiana, Illinois, and Washington state that are committed to developing a model system of juvenile justice, each different. They're not, it's not one size fit all, it's not a MacArthur model, uh, it's, uh, it's really uh, locally uh, developed but with some common principles and themes. And then we've chosen uh, a few other themes for what we call action networks that will involve other states. One theme is indigent defense. It's shocking to see uh, how underrepresented or poorly represented kids are. Uh, it doesn't have to be that way. Uh, a second theme uh, has to do with mental health. I mentioned earlier that a high proportion of kids who get in trouble have emotional difficulties. And so the juvenile justice system ought to take account of that with counseling both during and uh, after the uh, judicial appearance. And finally, um, and this is an issue I care very deeply about, uh, disproportional uh, minority uh, uh, contact, uh, the um, racial disparities in uh, the justice system are intolerable in uh, a democracy. If you look at the percent of kids who get in trouble and go deep into the system who are of color uh, versus white counterparts uh, and then compare that to the percentage of the population, it's uh, just shocking to see uh, how heavily burdened uh, the system is with people of color. It just isn't fair. And so we have these action networks uh, in uh, 12 other states, so now we have a total of 16 states involved in our Models for Change program. Where is and the, uh, with many more states wanting to get involved. So I think the moment is here and uh, that we are going to see uh, your dream of 40 or 50 years ago realized. Where is the opposition to this so obvious uh, statement of what the morality of it is, what the self-interest of it all is? Where, what's, what's the source of the opposition? Um, I think the source of the, op uh, of the opposition is, is, is ignorance. Uh, we need to educate the public about the facts that we've just talked about. Mm -hmm. uh, we did a study that um, asked uh, a random sample of people uh, if uh, there were a juvenile justice system in your state that um, had all these elements, uh, proper defense, um, diagnosis for mental illness, uh, alternatives to incarceration, uh, aftercare, uh, and if it were so that uh, kids who had that course of treatment uh, were 60 percent less likely to reoffend, uh, would you be willing to pay more money um, to put that system in place? And uh, 70 percent, I think, of the public surveyed said yes. 
So that suggests to me that when you tell the public, uh, give them good information, uh, they make wise choices and they're prepared uh, to make public investment uh, to do the right thing. Well, that's a fine statement of a belief in the uh, ultimate wisdom of the people. Remember, the New School came out of the progressive movement and uh, one central element of the progressive belief was that the people are wise and when they're given good information, they choose wise leaders and make good public choices and uh, I believe that. I know that you believe that because I've been reading a lot of what you've written, what you've said over the years. Uh, in fact, I, I want to throw a little side ball, a curve ball, I should say, at you about this. This business of the um, developmental rate of young people, that we can't assume that uh, youngsters are equipped to make the same decisions that we make uh, in later years. Does this ever give you any uh, reason to second guess the lowering of the voting age to 18? Do you think uh, there was some wisdom of the founders in an older age? Um, well, uh, 18 is the uh, age uh, which our study suggests that kids fully develop, uh, not fully developed, but are developed enough to uh, go to a, a adult court. So we're talking about uh, putting 13 and 14 and 15 year old kids through adult courts. Um, and the studies we show uh, uh, have supported show 18 is, is, is a So that is the, uh, the, the age you use. And there are individual differences. So here we're talking about averages, obviously. All right. Another question. Fairness, which looms so large for you. I find, when I talk about something in my, my classes uh, akin to the fairness doctrine, the old FCC doctrine that right. Ronald Reagan made sure to... Uh, push aside, we seem to believe, or so many of my students seem to believe, that fairness is too uh, wishy-washy a concept to be a guide. And I wondered what your comment is about that. That fairness sounds good, as liberty sounds good, uh, but it's not a real guide. There is nothing solid enough about the concept of fairness. I don't believe that, but I wonder how you feel about it. Well, I uh, think of fairness as a process, uh, not an outcome, or a process leading to an outcome. Uh, and I, I do believe you can judge whether a uh, process uh, is essentially fair uh, or not. Uh, and fair processes can make mistakes but that feels a lot better than a process that's blatantly unfair, uh, that's rigged, uh, and then has a predictable outcome. So uh, is MacArthur emphasizing procedural matters in the justice system? Well, yeah, but may I shift to our work uh, on international justice? Sure, please. Um, uh, MacArthur, uh, very first grant 30 years ago was to Amnesty um, uh, international. So we've had a long-standing uh, interest in human rights uh, and currently we support uh, groups like Human Rights Watch and the Physicians for Human Rights, uh, Interrights that form the backbone of the human rights movement worldwide. We also work on the ground uh, in three countries where we have offices, Russia, Nigeria, and Mexico, three countries making uh, transitions to democracy uh, on human rights issues in those countries. Uh, and then finally, we have had an interest in this emerging system of international justice that uh, probably goes back as far as the Geneva Treaties of 1864, but we think of it uh, um, uh, certainly since the uh, Nuremberg uh, tribunals and then in our own time the um, uh, ad hoc uh, tribunals on Yugoslavia and Rwanda and hybrids on Sierra Leone and Cambodia and East Timor and, and so forth. And finally, the um, International Criminal Court, the uh, first permanent uh, body uh, uh, there as a court of the last resort to, to try uh, cases of the worst crimes against uh, humanity that cannot be fairly tried within their national ju jurisdiction. So MacArthur has taken an interest in this emerging system that isn't just the ICC, but 
also these ad hoc tribunals, but very importantly and not much understood are regional human rights courts and commissions that now exist in Europe and Latin America, just coming along in Africa and perhaps over the horizon uh, in Asia. And so gradually uh, the world is developing um, a multi-layer system. National courts, of course, uh, that's the best place uh, to get justice close to home if it works. If it doesn't, uh, a next uh, place to go is a regional uh, court or commission. Uh, these are all treaty bodies and not every government signed up for them, but many have. And then finally, um, the International Criminal Court reserved for a handful of the very worst cases. Uh, uh, the Lords of Assistance Army in uh, northern Uganda, the uh, long-standing civil war in the Congo, uh, the most prominent case now, uh, Darfur. Uh, these are all cases that are uh, before the, uh, the new court in MacArthur has um, been working both with the ICC uh, and with the regional courts and commissions, but also with groups like Human Rights Watch uh, and the International Coalition on the uh, Criminal Court, in other words, NGOs, uh, to help um, get evidence, um, help train judges, uh, help um, prepare uh, witnesses and victims to participate in the processes. Uh, all this uh, heading for a day in which we hope there is uh, an effective system, multi-layered system of international justice that will deter uh, these awful crimes, these horrific crimes. And where, pray tell, has American officialdom be as you have been taking this stand? Well, America has a... That's really not a nasty question. Oh, no, I, I'm, I'm, I welcome it. Um, America has a noble history in uh, supporting uh, international justice. Uh, my father uh, was a prosecutor uh, uh, in, the, uh, in Germany uh, after, the, uh, after the war, so this is deep in my, my history and my consciousness. Um, America has not been a leader um, in the ICC. Uh, it uh, signed the Treaty of Rome but did not uh, ratify it, so it's not a member of the court. Uh, this is too bad because American uh, know-how and skills uh, would, be, uh, would be very useful uh, to this new institution as it's, uh, uh, as it's starting, but uh, the truth is uh, American opposition to the court has been uh, softening uh, and America has been helping. Uh, for example, um, uh, it did not veto the Security Council uh, referral of Darfur uh, to the court. It could have, it didn't. Um, it has been cooperative uh, with um, certain uh, uh, evidence that it has um, uh, made available to uh, the court uh, uh, in the Darfur case. Um, there is a provision in the Rome Treaty that gave rise to the court, Article 16, that uh, allows the Security Council to suspend the court's uh, action for a year, but it could be renewed, and some nations in Africa were trying to get an Article 16 action uh, to uh, suspend the Darfur case, and the U.S. Uh, let it be known that it might well veto that. So I think you have to say uh, that America has been moving uh, toward a more constructive um, relationship with the court, and uh, it's my firm belief that eventually the U.S. will, will join the court. With full support on the part of the American people or sufficient support? support. This may surprise you. Um, the, uh, with MacArthur's support, the Chicago uh, Council on Global Affairs does a uh, survey of American attitudes about international issues every four years. And uh, a couple of years ago, uh, they had a whole set of questions on the court. Um, and the question essentially was, do you think America should, should join the court? 71% of the public, and this is a nationwide survey, not just Chicago, 71% of the public said America ought to join the court. And the follow-up question was, well, um, wouldn't it worry you that um, some American personnel, military personnel might be brought up before the court? Mm, that uh, question knocked the approval percentage down to the high 60s. So even when the argument that's been most sensitive was put forward, the American people said, 
we want to be a member uh, of this court. We don't like <coughs> being on the outside. And I, I honestly believe that the American people want to be good partners uh, and participants in international fora, whether it's the um, International Criminal Court, whether it's the Global Forum on Migration, which we boycotted, uh, whether it's um, uh, Kyoto Protocols and, uh, and all the rest. So you think that the non-cooperation that has characterized the last eight years is not representative of American thinking? I believe Washington is out of step with how the American people think on, on these issues. And, I, and it's not uh, a Republican or a Democratic uh, issue only. It's not wishful thinking on your part. And we're talking real to real uh, well, here. Um, maybe you'll have me no back. No one's watching. Uh, well, maybe you'll have me back in four years, yeah. and you can ask me that question again. And uh, either we will or won't have made progress in uh, joining the court and uh, other uh, international fora. Our ox could be gored pretty uh, rigorously the more we move into this area, couldn't it? Uh, I'm not sure I understand the question. We could be, and it's a question you raised with, with yeah. others. Yeah. Uh, we could be endangering some in our own country with uh, universal uh, principles of justice and fairness. Uh, there have been those who have said Nuremberg trials in terms of some of the activities mm -hmm. in Iraq. Uh, do you feel that there is anything to that uh, concern that we may be putting our own officialdom at jeopardy? Uh, I really don't. Um, First of all, the uh, U.S., um, which participated in the Treaty of Rome, uh, took the lead in uh, inserting a provision called complementarity that basically says the court does, has no jurisdiction if there is a credible uh, process going on within the country. So it's a way out. Uh, so um, the U.S., I think, has a you know, good record of... Uh, uh, facing up to uh, accountability for its personnel who do things they shouldn't in wartime uh, situations. So that would be the first line of protection. The second is um, people thought, well, there'd be a lot of frivolous uh, charges against uh, Americans, as there have been. Courts rejected every single one of them. Every single one of them. So there is no suggestion here that uh, the prosecutor is going to be picking up uh, cases that are uh, put in uh, fingering uh, Americans. Third, uh, consider this. What's the alternative? Um, before the court came into being... For the, the alternative, we have one minute. Uh, there was um, a movement to um, something called universal jurisdiction, where countries like Belgium and others were saying uh, they would try these cases. Um, our officials are much better protected by the Treaty of Rome than they are by this amorphous uh, universal jurisdiction. Dr. Fenton, you will have to come back. I'd like Maybe to. not just four years from now, but sooner than that, to yeah. elaborate upon uh, what MacArthur is doing yeah. and the paths that what it's been doing are likely to take us. But thank you so much for joining me today on The Open Mind. Great pleasure to be here. Thank you. And thanks, too, to you in the audience. I hope you join us again next time. And for transcripts of today's program, please send $4 in check or money order to The Open Mind, P.O. Box 7977, FDR Station, New York, New York, 10150. Meanwhile, as an old friend used to say, good night and good luck.
Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from the Rosalind P. Walter Foundation, the Bluestein Family Foundation, the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, Carnegie Corporation of New York, the Russell Sage Foundation, the Malkin Fund, May and Samuel Rudin Family Foundation, and from the corporate community, Mutual of America.